Hello and welcome today to a new podcast episode. Today we are going to the cold far north of the United States, to Minnesota. And we are joined by James Reed, a political scientist at College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. He is a graduate of Harvard University and the author of quite a few books. He started with the early Republic, but more interesting to us here for the Civil War period. He also published in 2009, Majority Rule versus Consensus, the political thought of John C. Calhoun. And today we're talking with him about his newest book, which also came out by the University Press of Kansas, Sovereign of a Free People, Abraham Lincoln, Majority Rule, and Slavery. So first of all, thank you, Jim, for joining me today and to talk well, about you your new book. This, yeah, thank you for inviting me to this conversation. My pleasure. Um, so let's just right dive into the topic and... Let me bluntly ask, why another book on Lincoln? Well, there's a, I have a section in my intro that, that under that title, Why Another Book on Lincoln? Uh, my field is political theory. And for a long time, I wanted to write a book about Lincoln's political thought. I've read Lincoln for decades and taught him in courses, but I wanted to wait until I thought I had something new to say, because as you know, hundreds of thousands of books have been published about Lincoln, partly because the, the, the great complexity and importance of the period that he lived through. I think that is inexhaustible. But more specifically, it came, I realized that the, my contribution would be not some obscure corner some undiscovered document, but a big theme right in the middle of the room that was insufficiently discussed, which was Lincoln's understanding of majority rule, his defense of majority rule. Both of those were essential to, first of all, Lincoln's belief and hope that slavery could be abolished peacefully, gradually, and democratically. He did not want a civil war. Uh, that was something that he saw as forced upon him. So he relied upon the possibility of creating an enduring national anti-slavery majority to gradually, politically and economically, squeeze slavery out of existence. And so, um, and second, his defense of majority rule was central to his response to secession. The first seven slave states of the lower south seceded before Lincoln had even taken office. So that was not in response to anything Lincoln himself had done. He had just then been inaugurated. Uh, they seceded in, the, in response to the way in which millions of their fellow, fellow citizens had cast their votes. Um, so it was a dramatic uh, refusal to any longer to play by election rules. If the, if the south's uh, if the slaveholders preferred candidate, John Breckinridge had won the election, those seven same seven preemptively seceding states would have remained in the union and demanded that the free states respect the election results. So Lincoln's his understanding of majority rule and his defense of majority rule was central to what he hoped to accomplish uh, before civil war was forced upon him. Then once civil war was forced upon him with the Confederate assault on Fort Sumter, that then became um, central to Lincoln's own understanding of what the war was about. Well, yes, he wanted to he wanted to preserve the Union, but more importantly than that, he wanted to preserve uh, he wanted to, to defend the principle that political disagreements were to be resolved by, as he put it, time discussion and the ballot box by peaceful ballots, not bloody bullets. And so, especially in the early years of the war, before the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln's own understanding of what the purpose was of the war and what his aims were uh, in this war were to vindicate the democratic process against 
those who believe that they can tear up the democratic rules when the, the election results do not turn out as they want. So uh, it is a, so it is both a theoretical argument about you know, trying mm -hmm. to show how Lincoln understood majority rule, how how he believed it could work, what it could do well, uh, what some of its pitfalls were, um, but also uh, in practice, his hope that slavery could be peacefully abolished. And then when that history didn't take that course, uh, this became, this shaped how he understood uh, what the war was about. And it's, it's very interesting. I, I kind of had to smile when you said like, majority rule and like the results mm -hmm. of elections and it, it it so took me back to my own first book with some of the individuals I studied from the 48 uprising that then came to the United States and they were very active in the um, radical Republican movement mm -hmm. in 1864 out of, out of the Cleveland convention right. and there's one individual who's just like I hate Lincoln. I don't like the way he's doing this. And then instead of respecting the outcome of the election, the majority decision decides to leave. And it it, it always mm. struck me as sort of like, these are individuals who advocate for majority rule, like mm -hmm. the majority in a democratic fashion should determine the course of the future. Mm -hmm. And then they turn around when the majority decides to go a route that they don't like. And they don't respect it themselves. Yes. Well, I think that, you know, that in many respects, it is somewhat unnatural to respect election results. People have to learn to do that. Mm -hmm. People have yeah. to be taught. And, and, and if they've forgotten it, remember why it is mm -hmm. we do this. Yes. And so uh, I think that's true in the United States right now. Uh, mm -hmm. People have to remember why we have elections and what they accomplish. And, you know, if, if you only respect an election result, if your candidate wins, then you really don't you don't really believe in elections at all. Right. And so right. uh, in that sense, I think Lincoln's. Uh, Lincoln's the thought that he put into mm -hmm. majority rule and elections and defending them and defending them is something important and, mm -hmm. and sacred. Yeah. Um, that message is, is an important one for where we are in the world today, uh, in the United States and elsewhere. Um, so let me ask you this, because so much about majority rule of like democracy revolves around the notion of the people like mm -hmm. the, the electorate or however we want to define it. So how would you or how would Lincoln or how would anybody around 1850, 1860 see the people? What, 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 who would they consider part of this body who can vote? <laughs> well, that's a complicated question. Yes. Um, and so Lincoln, You're welcome, by the way. Yes, Lincoln, in a sense, had two different answers to that. Mm -hmm. um, Lincoln acknowledged in principle, and this is, this, this is true in his 1854 speech against the Kansas Nebraska Act, that in principle, all adult um, residents of a territory were entitled to equal, to equal participation in making the laws by which they were governed. So consent of the governed in that uh, democratic principled uh, perspective would require not only the abolition of slavery, but also full civil and political rights for uh, all citizens, uh, regardless of race, regardless of sex. Uh, and Lincoln recognized that, but at the same time, he also recognized that the white Americans who were the vast mm -hmm. majority uh, were absolutely opposed to living up to, to being social and political equals mm -hmm. with black Americans. Okay. So uh, you have, so the, that's, uh, and Lincoln did not know how to resolve that. We can go into his attempts uh, um, to finesse that he, he, uh, in principle, 
everyone, regardless of race, deserves full civil and political rights. Mm -hmm. In practice, that he believed that was impossible in the United States because of white opposition. Mm -hmm. uh, that changed during the Civil War when hundreds of thousands of Black Americans fought for the unions. So mm -hmm. from Lincoln's point of view, that changed the calculation, uh, made uh, it much more possible to see um, Black Americans as part of the American people, um, as having patriotism toward the toward the United mm -hmm. States. Um, so that's so you have in one sense a single people, but in another sense you have a really divided people. Mm -hmm. um, you could even you could take the question further because. Um, if going back to John C. Calhoun, uh, you know, the state's rights theorist, Calhoun said there was no people of the United States. There was only the people of South Carolina, the people of Alabama, the people of Mississippi. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Lincoln clearly believed there was a was a people of the United States mm -hmm. that the individual member states Illinois, uh, Indiana, Kentucky, uh, all of those were part of this, this single people of the United States. And in that sense, as in many others, uh, Lincoln and John C. Calhoun were coming from opposite poles. Right. And it's it sort of because your first book dealt with Hamilton and Madison yeah. and Jefferson and sort of the early Republic. It, it sort of reminds me of, I think it was Madison in one of the Federalist letters kind of talking about also majority rule and yeah. um, him being more worried about giving the right yeah. to vote to too many people. How, how much did sort of the founding generation influence Lincoln's thought and where did he break with that as well? Well, of course, Lincoln admired the founding generation, mm -hmm. and um, he he, I suppose you could say that he made a, had the most generous reading of the founders, the founding generation. That right. Lincoln believed that the founding generation had clearly marked slavery as an evil to be mm -hmm. uh, abolished, if not immediately, then as fast as as quickly as circumstances permit. Mm -hmm. And Lincoln said that the, the founding generation had uh, tolerated slavery only where some uh, urgent necessity required it mm -hmm. and had uh, prohibited wherever they had power to do so. Um, I believe that's an overly generous reading of the founders as a whole. It certainly describes some of them. Uh, and. It is true that the founding generation, and this includes James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, uh, though they were slaveholders, they did recognize that slaveholding was a violation of the natural rights that they proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence. Um, but the, the real question is, how much did that translate into action? Right. And I, much as I admire Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, um, they did not act as though, Jefferson especially, did not act as though ending slavery was the most urgent thing on the political agenda. And unfortunately, uh, I think Jefferson and that founding generation lost an opportunity with the Louisiana Purchase, where because yeah. it wasn't an existing state, you know, it was a, the it was the federal constitution did not give Congress the authority to abolish slavery in an existing state, but uh, Louisiana was new territory. Most of it, yeah. uh, outside of New Orleans, most of it was still untainted by slavery. And um, Jefferson did not, in practice, do much to prevent slavery from spreading to that new territory. So okay. I think Lincoln's reading of the founding generation was overly generous. Uh, but uh, Lincoln himself, I think in, in, to, in Lincoln's favor, he was actually willing to act much okay. more strongly against slavery than the founding generation was. So in that sense, you could say Lincoln's overly generous reading of the founding inspired him 
to act in the way that the founders ought to have acted. <laughs> well, yeah, he, like, I, I write the wrongs made by or things forgotten by the yeah. founders. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, uh, that's, I would say you mentioned James Madison, uh, James Madison and majority rule too. So, yes. So, uh, let me describe some of the. Uh, similarities and some of the differences between uh, Lincoln and James Madison. Um, you know, both Lincoln and Madison recognized that majorities could act unjustly. Mm -hmm. So Lincoln was not this uncritical. Uh, he did not believe the voice of the majority was the voice of God. He understood that majorities could act unjustly. They could be unwise. Uh, but for Lincoln, the alternative, which was to put permanent power in a minority was even worse. So the what what majorities have in favor of themselves is that their um, their injustices, their uh, lack of their errors are correctable in a way mm -hmm. that through deliberation, I mean, it doesn't ha automatically happen through time and deliberation and shifting public opinion. The the uh, errors and shortfallings of majority rule can be corrected. In that sense, I think he. He and James Madison thought along similar lines. Mm -hmm. um, Madison, um, even though Madison in Federalist Number 10, Federalist Number 51, talked about the importance of slowing down majority rule, mm -hmm. still major Link, uh, both Lincoln and Madison understood that in the end, it still was going to be the majority that would rule. It's a mm -hmm. question of you, you, you set up processes to make that majority more thoughtful, more deliberate, in the hope that its its uh, decisions will be wiser and more just. Mm -hmm. But there's but there's no guarantee in that. Another respect in which Madison and Lincoln were alike was that Madison, when the John C. Calhoun's doctrine of nullification came along, in the late 1820s, 1830s, Madison was still alive, and he very clearly and publicly denounced that mm -hmm. as a perversion of uh, the Republican Republican principle and a perversion of the principles of the Constitution. That that one single state could declare itself sovereign and overrule the decisions of the federal Congress, federal court, president. Um, uh, Madison thought was standing uh, Republican principle on its head, which still required that ultimately the majority was the decision maker. In that sense, too, uh, Lincoln and Madison were uh, very much on the same page. Uh, there, there are differences. Um, uh, Lincoln was much more on, on, on factions and political parties. Uh, uh, James Madison treated factions as an evil, but an unavoidable evil, you have to you have to take account of them. They're not going to go away, uh, but they were still uh, disruptive. Um, whereas Lincoln had a much more positive view of a political party uh, uh, of the kind that he sought to build as a Whig, and then especially as mm -hmm. to build the Republican Party in the 1850s. Um, he uh, he believed that a, a uh, mass-based uh, political party capable of, of winning national elections was the only way that you could address um, major issues like slavery. Right. And the only way you could address them peacefully. You know, they, he, he understood that he viewed that that, that if the Republican Party didn't exist, there would be no peaceful outlet yeah. for people's moral and political opposition to slavery and it would then necessarily take violent forms. So a political party for Lincoln was really important. And he he saw that. Uh, I say this because political parties have such a negative view right now in the United States right. and elsewhere. Yes. I understand that. Lincoln's political party was not a worshiping of one person. That is not at all the kind of party that he meant. A, a party was something that agreed upon a certain set of principles mm -hmm. and the, the, the party's candidates like Lincoln himself in 1858 in the U S Senate election in, um, 
in Illinois in his 1860 election, he was running on a platform, a certain set of principles that uh, he considered, um, you know, were, were kind of pledge of faith on his part. Yeah. So political parties, as he understood them, were democratic. They they went to the grassroots. Uh, they began uh, person to person, face to face. And um, they they were an alternative to violence. They were also an alternative to one man personalistic style of rule of a kind that, you know, w- w- Lincoln didn't practice that, and um, that's not the sort of political party he built. I want to go back. So what you said, and admittedly, I was not aware that Madison actually had made a statement about nullification. Yeah, um, we. <laughs> it's it's an interesting part that we kind of forget that Madison is still there, and yeah. um, but then I think the the part that I want to get to is the sort of irony, if you like, that. In part, Calhoun builds on the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, which Madison and Jefferson wrote, right, as almost an attempt to nullify a federal law. Yes, and now right. he turns around; it's like, no, 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 don't. That's not what I meant to say there. Yes, well, well, okay. So this would be a longer conversation, but in in uh, <laughs> give um, the my, cliff notes, my previous man. book on Calhoun. Um, I argue that that Madison actually was consistent, that uh, that that Madison's the Virginia resolutions that he drafted in Mm -hmm. 1798 did not um, envision that a single state could declare a law to be unconstitutional. And here there was a difference between the the Virginia resolutions that James Madison drafted and the Kentucky resolutions that Thomas Jefferson drafted, which really do come close to the Jefferson kind of the radical. Yeah. <laughs> that that uh, Calhoun later picks up on. So um, I think Calhoun, uh, you know, by the time that Calhoun was came along with nullification, Thomas Jefferson was already dead, had already died mm-hmm. by that time. So it was not in a position to answer, but Matt, James Madison was convenient, un, inconveniently, from Calhoun's point of view, still alive and responded mm-hmm. publicly. Right. Um, so uh, there, scholars will debate on whether uh, Madison somehow reversed himself. Uh, there, there are people who take that stance, um, mm-hmm. and I, I argue for his consistency. But in any case. It's unquestionable that in 1830, 1831, 1832, uh, James Madison was clearly denouncing nullification of uh, of the sort. Um, he also uh, argued that there there could be no constitutional right of secession. Huh. Wow, we we may have to get back together and do a second meeting one day and talk about yeah. secession yeah, and it intellectual would be, that would be development. A whole, whole other rabbit hole to go down. Yeah, uh, that, that would be fun. Is, to just... you know, but these these things are are relevant yeah. to Lincoln because yeah. they were on his mind and and uh, people understood the, that you know secession and civil war had this right. back history to it. Right. Exactly. And there is that. People sometimes forget there is this long history that gates into the early republic yeah. when it comes to that secessionist thought process. Um, so, but let's let's turn to some other aspects with regard okay. to Lincoln because, um, yeah, it's actually let's go to this because we're I I want to hold off on party organization and the <laughs> role of slavery until kind of <laughs> we're already halfway through kind of but i i was really stuck by you you kind of talking about lincoln's 1860 election and the southern states like not even having him like available that people couldn't even vote for him and that like when when we started corresponding about two weeks ago after i read your book of course was like in light of at the time, the Supreme Court of Colorado <laughs> saying, like, yeah, we, we, we're going to take Trump off. Maine saying we're going to take him off. Illinois saying we're going to take him off. And now, like, just 
few days, like the 24 hours, 48 hours before we talked, the Supreme Court ruled now that said, no, Trump versus Anderson, he can stay on the ballot. And in, in part, I think you, you have a very, let's start with, first of all, the relevance of your book. How 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 much do you see your book also speaking from the past to the current situation in the country? Well, clearly, you know, I should first point out I was working on this book for more than 10 years. So um it's ironic had, how I things a, catch I up. Had full, I had a full uh, manuscript almost ready to submit to press when the January 6, 2021 assault on the U.S. Capitol wow. occurred. Um, but I, during the whole decade that I was writing this book, I could see that the United States politics was becoming increasingly divided. Mm. And it increasingly felt like uh, what the 1850s must have felt like to the people who lived through that in the United States. And that decade did not end well. So I could see as I was writing the book that American democracy was deeply divided and heading towards some crisis, although I couldn't have imagined the form that it took. When the uh, January 6, 2021 assault on the U.S. Capitol, it was not a spontaneous no. event. It was for the purpose of preventing Congress from uh, doing its constitutional duty, which was to count and tabulate and announce the results of the presidential election. So in that respect, it was parallel to the act of the first seven states exactly. seceding from the union before Lincoln could even take office uh, because they did not like the election results. Right. Uh, it was and a in dramatic- the same way, you could say it yeah. wasn't spontaneous, yeah. but the seceding states did. Right. It was very yeah. much planned and Right. And and I would say, too, the reason they did it, the reason that that the argument for preemptive secession mm -hmm. uh, uh, won the day in the lower south was that they believed that Lincoln's and the Republican Party's platform of democratically and gradually squeezing slavery out of existence was very realistic and likely to work if uh not immediately uh refused mm -hmm. so um in that sense I, I emphasize that because people often uh talk about lincoln's idea of the ultimate extinction of slavery as though it's some vague empty idea there was not a toothless idea it had real meaning mm -hmm. for slaveholders um and they saw with Lincoln's election the real prospect that slavery would be squeezed out of existence over the course of several decades, and they were willing to go to, to civil war to prevent that. Uh, and it had to begin by simply by dramatically refusing to accept the legitimacy of this election. Now, let me then, having said that, point to some differences. They, the the uh, secessionists did not claim that Lincoln had somehow only won the election because millions of fugitive slaves had fraudulently voted in northern states. They did not invent fables of a stolen election. They understood and acknowledged that Lincoln had won the election by the constitutional rules. And they simply said, we were refusing to play by the constitutional rules anymore. We are, we are breaking with this constitution and the nation uh, in that sense, they were more honest about what they were doing mm -hmm. than the uh, the people who assaulted the right. the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. Um, it's there were also the differences in the sense that the uh, secessionists were not claiming the right to rule the country whose elections mm -hmm. they had just rejected, uh, only to break with it. Right. Whereas the the Insurrectionists of January 6, 2021 did claim the right yes. that the person they supported should continue to rule the country whose elections he had just lost. Yes. So yes. both of those comparisons, I think, um, those differences, um, and ironically put the, the 
Southern secessionists in somewhat more favorable light, uh, at least a more a more uh, principled light. Right. Um, and then the final difference is no one, none of the, on neither side of the Civil War, neither Jefferson Davis nor Abraham Lincoln were seeking one man rule. Right. Had they sought it, they would not have gotten it. Mm -hmm. uh, this was, uh, in that sense, there was a uh, still commitment to Republican principles on both sides of that divide. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so th so there are, are uh, parallels between the two events and also non-parallels between mm -hmm. the two events. But going back to your, your question about the, the Lincoln being kept off the ballot and the attempt um, on the part of some states to keep Donald Trump off the ballot in 2024. I mean, those were happened for very different reasons. Mm -hmm. The uh, in the case of the effort of some states to um keep Donald Trump off the ballot. They were referring to section two of the 14th amendment mm -hmm. that banned somebody that uh, from, um, from being a candidate for office who has uh, incited insurrection against the United States. Mm -hmm. So that didn't have any parallel to Lincoln being kept off the ballot. Lincoln had not incited insurrection against anyone or anything. Um, so I, I Lincoln's being kept off the ballot in most of the southern states, most of the slave states. There were exceptions, which I'll come to. Um, they simply did not want any anti-slavery presence in their states. Those states mm -hmm. had done everything possible to prevent any anti-slavery speech, even of the mildest kind, from being printed, published, mm -hmm. distributed through the mails. Um, uh, so... Whereas to allow the Republican Party and its candidate, uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln in 1860, to allow them a presence, mm -hmm. even though there was no chance of them winning, right. there was no chance that the Republican Party was going to win the election in any slave state. Right. Um, but still, their presence was a public acknowledgement of anti-slavery views of a kind that the, the slave states had tried to completely eradicate from their their public discussion. So that's the reason why Lincoln was kept off the, the ballot in, in all the states of the Lower South. Uh, Lincoln was on the ballot in Virginia, Maryland, Missouri, Kentucky, Delaware. All of those were slave states at the time. Uh, he did receive, um, you know, uh, not close to a majority, but he did receive several thousand votes in Virginia, and yeah. you know, especially in the part that later broke off and became West Virginia, yeah. did best in Missouri. Um, so, uh, and the part of one of the um, things that I found from looking at the the arguments for preemptive secession, why people thought we have to get, why secession is we have to get out now. Mm -hmm. One of the things I came across, if we don't get out now, uh, this is coming from Tennessee, the Republican Party will openly run a candidate in Tennessee in 1864, right. which of course they would. So, you know, so they were afraid that over time, the Republican Party would begin to gain support, at least in the upper South, where slavery was less entrenched, and that um, some of these upper South states like Missouri, Maryland, uh, could flip and become mm -hmm. free states. So that's the reason why they wanted to keep them off the ballot. And, you know, in that sense, the fear that they would not be able to keep him off the ballot forever was one of the motivations for mm -hmm the notion that they needed to secede before he could be inaugurated. And but based on the constitution, it is within the state purview to to run the election run an election. Right. So... There was no yeah, there was much of of uh election law now is uh in the United States is is you know fourteenth amendment equal to protection of the law, fifteenth amendment uh franchise uh in the um before the Civil War, 
the federal constitution said very little about how said almost nothing about who could vote in elections yeah um and very or even little who's about the electors election. like who picks yeah. the electors wasn't even in it so right the the constitution <laughs> all that the constitution does is specify for the electoral college is to specify the formula by which the number of the state's electors are determined and some of the process about you know where they gather and and uh the votes and and some of the procedures uh you know that the votes are to be then counted in congress um but uh, most of you know the, the, most of election law and and sp particularly everything connected with an equal right to vote is all post civil war right uh, be before the civil war because of slavery there could have been no agreement on that among the states but i i kind of was in part i wanted to ask about this because um there were a number of historians who wrote like uh briefs in support of the insurrection clause in the 14th amendment and nice. kind of keeping trump off the ballot and when i read that section in your book i kind of was like why don't we make this case you know states in 1860 said no we we're not gonna let you vote for a guy that we think will be dangerous yeah. for the country or the state which is a precedent to keep somebody off the ballot yeah. Why didn't we use that? It, it seems way more logical and yeah. more convincing than try and create a 14th Amendment case for yeah. somebody who isn't technically yet convicted of that crime. Yeah. But in any case, that's that's uh, that's all water under the bridge in terms of right, the yeah. 24 election. So true. <laughs> Well, let's it, it, will be, to... it will be it will be determined by the voters. Which I, yeah. I think it's how Lincoln himself would have said. Ultimately, uh, it is the people of the United States that have to make a decision of this kind. Yeah, yeah, and that uh, that's a perfect segue over to parties because I think yeah. that's another important part that you kind of talk about with regard to party development and mm -hmm. Lincoln's role in it. And I was so reminded when you talked about like, I think it was the 1848 election and how Winfield Scott just ran on nothing. Like, oh, oh that was uh, 1850, 1852. Sorry, yeah. yes, 1852 yeah, election and just ran on yeah. nothing. And you and Lincoln was like, you got to stand for something. People need right. to know what you stand for. Well, and then he felt that Lincoln felt that way in 1848 also with Zachary right. Taylor. That he, uh, for both Zachary Taylor in 1848 and Winfield Scott in 1852, although he supported both of them, privately he was very disappointed uh, at the uh, emptiness of their mm -hmm. platforms. And yeah. in both cases, hope to give um, both, uh, hope to give them more, more substance, right. um, you know, this is part of the reason why the Whigs didn't survive into the much into the 1850s. Right. You it know. did remind me though a little bit of um goodness, I think it was yeah, Michael Holt's book where he kind of makes the case that part of the change over from the Whig Democratic Party system to the Republican Democratic system was sort of that you couldn't distinguish anymore between yeah. Who is Whig? What does a Whig stand for, and what do Democrats stand for? And it seems right. like that that comes out with sort of Lincoln's criticism there of the yeah. candidates not standing right. like, with any principle. Well, well, I mean, I mean, my Holt makes a case, and I agree with this. Part of the the problem with the Whigs by eighteen the eighteen fifty two election, they were trying to avoid the two major issues that were on people's right. minds were slavery. And immigration, the, mm -hmm. the you know the, the the large number of immigrants coming to the United States, and then the anti-immigrant sentiment, those were the two big issues mm -hmm. in the 1850s. Right. Um, Lincoln, of course, wanted to emphasize the slavery issue and downplay immigration. Yeah. Um, uh, whereas, but the Whigs in 1852 wanted to avoid both of those issues, and and as, and as a result, they were pretty much running on fumes at that point right 
What do you run yeah, on? So, it's you avoid the yeah. biggest issues of the time, right? Yeah. Right. That would be today, like, oh, I'm going to ignore immigration. I'm going to ignore abortion. I'm going to ignore, yeah. like, military conflict in Ukraine. I'm just going to, like, right. be in, have my head in the clouds. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you, you could say that um, candidates and parties today that say, let's let's ignore all these divisive issues and just come together on the fact that we're all Americans. <laughs> That's just an empty answer. Right. You know, that's like the John Bell's um, candidacy, yeah. 1860 election. Let's, Union Party. Let's ignore the slavery issue and let's let's just come together in support of the Constitution. Well, but people had radically different ideas yeah. about what the Constitution said about slavery. And if you don't address those, this idea of coming to the center and let's all get along doesn't get you anywhere. No. I think Lincoln understood that. That you that political parties were a way of making a choice mm -hmm. on deeply divided questions, a way of making the choice peacefully rather than violently. But those issues could be very, you know, the slavery issue. What to mm -hmm. do about slavery was a was a really important issue. It had to be decided one way or another, mm -hmm. and um, the only way. Um, the only way that you could decide that nationally was if, if there was a major political party that took that stance that slavery right. should be, this the expansion of slavery should be stopped. Mm -hmm. And that was in a position then to, for people to, to cast their votes. Right. I mean, before the Republican Party, there were many people who were very troubled about slavery. There was no major party for whom they could cast their votes. The abolitionist parties um, were, never received more than a small fraction of the votes. The Republican Party was, a, for the first time, you know, millions of Americans who were troubled by slavery could cast their votes for a party that actually had an opportunity of winning. And um, that is, uh, so parties have to take stances on on mm -hmm. deeply divisive issues. Right. And, you know, I make the case in the book that for Lincoln, this was a, a, the a major political party taking a stance on slavery was the only peaceful route yeah. of, a, of resolving the slavery issue. Mm -hmm. And of course it, it didn't work out that way. Even, even the, the peaceful election of a Republican candidate was enough for the, the slave states of the lower South to say, we're not playing by the rules anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least Lincoln's hope was that this if there is a peaceful route to the end of slavery, it's going to have to be in this kind of way through a, a right. political party taking a clear public stance, then being rewarded by the voters uh -huh. for its stance, and then being able then uh, to actually put policies into place. Yeah. I mean, if the I could say this is another difference with with political parties for political parties for Lincoln could not just be grandstanding. Mm -hmm. They could just be taking positions to, to feed the emotions of their base. They had to want, if the voters trusted them with their votes and elected them, they had to be able and willing to deliver on at least some of what uh, their platform uh, prescribed. Yeah. We could go down a modern rabbit hole again with that. Yeah. And, <laughs> but I think that that leads to the other point that was very fascinating in your book with regard to Lincoln, where you kind of say that Lincoln understands a very important dynamic here that this is not going to be a permanent issue, that right now voters see slavery as an issue. And you have to capitalize on it now mm -hmm. because in 10 years... It may be another issue. Mm -hmm. Well, I think he re he believed it would take longer than ten years. I think he yeah. believed the slavery issue. Yeah. Well, that that his his word was once slave the, the public mind has to come to agreement that slavery will be put in course of ultimate extinction. Mm -hmm. Once, in a sense, those that those policies are in place, we can talk about what what some of the specifics of that might have been. Um, then I think he considered it natural that 
uh, attention would turn back to other issues. I mean, the, 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 during the 1850s, the other major issue was immigration in the United mm-hmm. States. You had an enormous number of immigrants uh, coming, from, especially from Germany and Ireland, uh, who were, um, you know, changing the American culture. As in the case of uh, of the Irish and and uh, many of the Germans, they were Catholic, which threatened, you know, the Protestant majority in the United mm-hmm. States. Um, many of these immigrants, there were, you know, um, many of them were very rowdy. Um, and so yeah. it was a, it was a, uh, a legitimate issue what you do about immigration. Um, Lincoln himself was very pro-immigrant. Mm-hmm. Um, he certainly he made a, uh, great efforts uh, with large degree of success to uh, to enlist the German immigrants in support of the Republican Party. The Irish immigrants were mostly uh, already uh, mostly supporting the Democratic Party, but he uh, he was very insistent about uh, getting the support of the German immigrants. He had many of his major speeches translated into German. Right. He subsidized the publication of a German language uh, political newsletter. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, Lincoln needed the support of the anti-immigrant voters. Right. So because um, many of the, what, what they called the know-nothings, um, the anti-immigrant voters were also anti-slavery. Mm-hmm. Um, Lincoln found this combination puzzling because he believed that, you know, all men are created equal, uh, yeah. uh, prohibited uh, disenfranchising, discriminating against people for, for any reason. But practically speaking, uh, he, in order to build this Republican Party that was going to be effective in halting and eventually shrinking slavery, he needed both the votes of pro-immigrant anti-slavery voters and anti-immigrant anti-slavery voters. And Lincoln managed, and his party building managed to pull that off um, Mm. by, by... emphasizing and this is you know that i think one of the points of his house divided speech of 1858 the only issue he mentions is slavery right. and i think that's deliberate on his part they all everyone knew that immigration was still in the background there it continued right. to be an issue through the, the republican convention in 1860 but lincoln was um persistently saying right. to to both sides of the immigration debate, the slavery issue is the most important one. We have to address this. Right. Um, and I think he, going back to your original point, I think Lincoln understood there was almost something unnatural about this coalition. <laughs> that once slavery, if slavery could be right. put in, solidly put in course of ultimate extinction, then it's almost natural that the differences between this coalition are going to come out and maybe they will find expression in different parties. Right. It, it almost reminds me of the first of the podcast episode when I talked to Frank Cirello uh, of the abolitionist civil war. Mm-hmm. And like, as soon as emancipation happens, this yeah, abolitionist yeah. alliance just falls to pieces of like, how right. far do we want to go? How, um, yeah. And that's like, Considering the Republican Party has all these component pieces, yeah. uh, it's a realistic fear. Well, I mean, fear. I think that's that that's that that is a te- natural tendency in democratic politics, but it also right. shows how how much careful, deliberate effort has to mm-hmm. be put into making those coalitions work, even if they don't work forever. If you can get them to work for ten years or twenty years, that's a major mm-hmm. accomplishment. Right. And Lincoln put so much thought and thought and effort into making um, the Republican Party work as a party that included both pro and anti-immigrant. It, it included included uh, abolitionists at one side and, ver- and at the other end, people who, um, w- as long as he stopped the spread of slavery, they weren't troubled by it. Yeah. So he had to, he had to keep all of these very different factions 
working together. So because Lincoln believed from the beginning that there was a in sentiment, in moral sentiment, there was a majority of the American public, even a majority of the white public, mm -hmm. who knew that slavery was wrong. But if you can't get that majority to work together politically, they cease to be a majority. Mm -hmm. And they will be defeated by a minority who is more committed and, and more organized. So uh, that's why for Lincoln, putting together a, a national enduring anti-slavery coalition was so important and, and uh, his party building was so important and his um, being strategic about what issues the party would focus on was important. Well, you, you already kind of raised the, the issue that I was going to ask next about because that's, he, he very much emphasized that human element of like, let's have sympathy for these yeah. enslaved people in the South. It's like, not like, we're not going to look at it as competition economically. We're not going to look at it as like, what's going to happen. We're not going to talk yet about like civil rights. We're just going to focus that this is an unnatural state. Yeah. So it it yes, it think, feels a little bit like least common denominator, but it's yeah. very much playing on human sympathy. Yeah. Like well, it it I mean, yes. So Lincoln, and this goes, <laughs> you get this very well in his 1854 speech uh, against the Kansas and Nebraska Act, mm -hmm. that he believed that um, the vast majority of human beings, even mm -hmm. in the South, uh, recognized that an enslaved person was a human being. Uh, that a suffering you have a, a suffering human being mm -hmm. that there is that there is even though legally they are a piece of property you actually know that is not the case mm -hmm. um that that natural sympathy it can be it can be dampened by economic self-interest it can be deadened uh, he also admitted there were some people that didn't feel it. He called them natural tyrants. So I think he would include slave traders, uh, slave dealers as these natural tyrants who really did not feel uh, mm -hmm. these human sympathies, but he thought most people did. And so it was a least common denominator, but uh, it helped that he believed almost all human beings were capable of these sympathies and that they could be invoked. Mm -hmm. On top of that, but really as a separate kind of motivation, he believed it was true and, and possible to persuade wh white Americans, white non-slaveholding Americans, that the expansion and perpetuation of slavery threatened their rights and their economic self-interest. Mm -hmm. So Lincoln is, in the sense, both enlisting a kind of disinterested <laughs> sympathy for an enslaved person as a fellow human being, and a self-interest argument. Um, I, because he, he probably realized, I mean, the self-interested is a stronger motive, but it also needs to be explained. Right. So, you know, what your self-interest is, is not as immediately obvious. So mm -hmm. self-interest mm -hmm. just requires reasoned explanation. Sympathy right. has the advantage that it's, it's pre-rational. Mm -hmm. Both of those, he believed, were necessary uh, um, motivational supports for building an anti-slavery majority, and and, the, and particularly on the on the side of northern uh, white workers, I think this is really important. I think one of the things that my book brings out more than other books on Lincoln have is how Lincoln was very deliberate about trying to persuade white northern workers who were not slaveholders mm -hmm. um, that the abolition of slavery did not threaten their interest and in fact actually uh, advanced their interest. So, I mean, so what was he arguing against? And I think uh, many of the white workers would say, well, I'm, I don't like slavery, but if slavery is abolished, all those mm -hmm. former slaves will come up here and compete with me for a job. In the same way that people in many places are afraid that, of immigrants coming mm -hmm. in and competing with them for jobs. And so you, the, the white northern working class people whose, whose votes were essential to Lincoln to try to stop the spread of slavery were very susceptible to this argument that's, that 
uh, the, the black man's uh, economic advancement will come at their expense. Right. And Lincoln said no. Actually, the abolition of slavery would improve your situation and raise your wages. Right now, you are already competing with them. Mm -hmm. This is a national economy. You are competing with them. Uh, they are working for free. So you are competing with somebody who is who is free labor because who is who is uh, being paid zero <laughs> wages because it's forced labor. If slavery is abolished, they will certainly no longer work for zero pay. They will demand wages. If they demand wages, that will the black workers' wages going up will also cause white workers' wages to go up. And there, in that sense, you have a direct economic self-interest in abolishing slavery because it is actually slavery that is pulling your wages down, not the color of the skin of the person uh, who you may be competing with for a job. And in economic terms, competing with a black person is no different from competing with a white person for a job. The only thing that makes a difference is if, if those black people are enslaved and working for free. So right. that, so Lincoln worked hard to make that argument both before the civil war and in uh in 1862 on the eve of the emancipation proclamation he made that argument again mm. and lincoln's argument and the the chapter six of my book uh uses this as a title phrase the plank is large enough so this mm. is from speeches that lincoln was giving in 1859 1860 where he said people some people think that relations between the black man and the white man are like um, two shipwrecked sailors and there is only one plank and only one person can fit on the plank and the only way the white man can survive is by pushing the black man off and lincoln says if that were the case it wouldn't make any difference what were the race of the other person was i would push a white man off a black man if i had to survive but he says that is not the case the yeah. plank is large enough. We, it is, our economy is not such that the black man can only gain at, at white man's expense. No, that we have an economy, a free labor economy is one in which people can uh, gain prosperity together. Right. And uh, Lincoln worked hard to make that argument in his own time. And I think the argument needs to be, is, is still relevant to the United States today. It's still the case in the United States, a, a, a large percentage of, of white Americans see black Americans' gain, economic gains as coming at their expense. And I think that was, it was uh, not the case in, in 1860, and it's not the case today. No, I was just going to say that too. That's like, it's still still an issue and it still holds true that there is for mm -hmm. everyone a space to survive and live and have a happy time happy being right uh, of course that in part though i kind of as you were talking i was thinking also towards the other part towards the end of your book now where this now kind of starts to little backfire on Luke. Well, he founds that common denominator that we have the sympathy and self-interest but he didn't have the public behind him then to go the next step and say yeah. let's give african americans these formerly enslaved people also then civil rights right. so he it yes it, and so lincoln lincoln he, he believed that the most white americans were capable of recognizing enslaved persons as fellow human beings he believed mm -hmm. most uh white workers could be with with effort could be persuaded that um, they could share a free labor market with black workers without any great harm to themselves mm -hmm. he did not believe the the vast majority of white americans would accept to be equal fellow citizens and voters with black americans right. um this contrasted with the abolitionists, I mean, Frederick Douglass, Wendell Phillips, who argued, you know, for what justice really what prescribes is that uh, every person, 
regardless of race, should be given a vote. And Lincoln's own principles, as I mentioned, his own principles, going back to his statement in his 1854 uh, Kansas-Nebraska speech, that uh, all human beings are entitled to equal participation in the laws by which they're governed. So Lincoln never made or even attempted to make a principled argument as to why only white people should have the vote. His only argument was that in practice, white Americans are dead set against it. I don't know how to change that. Right. And, um, you know, you can still, I, I don't think, I, I would not dispute the accuracy of the statement. It was, it was empirically an accurate statement. You can argue, uh, you can criticize Lincoln for not challenging it more than he did. Uh, and, you know, it's I, it's good that there were abolitionists out there challenging it and helping and helping to create a, a different climate of public opinion. Um, but I, I think that the, the major changes in public opinion that made the 14th and 15th Amendments possible, 14th Amendment equal protection of the law, 15th Amendment voting rights came during the Civil War itself. Mm -hmm. And um, that at uh, people were in the North were so angry at the slaveholders right. that they were willing to go further th uh, than they would have before the war. Yeah. And then uh, really important, the fact that um, black uh, men in enormous numbers fought for the Union yeah. gave them a stake so that by the end of the war, uh, Lincoln is arguing that um, is, uh, comes out of support for black voting rights, beginning with those who served in the military. And uh, there's some evidence that um, John Wilkes Booth was already plotting, but John, that there's some evidence that this may have put him okay. over the top, oh. um, that it was uh, citizenship and voting rights, right. more than just the abolition of slavery that was um, the reason why he assassinated Lincoln. Yeah. Well, and I think that's uh, kind of going back to Frank's book that we, that I interviewed the kind of gosh, a couple of weeks ago of this notion that the abolitionists themselves don't help the cause much either to say break apart over like, yeah. Um, what, what direction should we take after emancipation and yeah. guys like Garrison saying, well, uh, emancipation right. happened we're done we're we're right. out of here and it's it it it's a it's a very sad reality at the end yeah. of the war of like you give freedom but what next right of. well i would just say you know in, in defense semi-defense of the abolitionists those were really difficult problems too and oh, if, God, lincoln, yeah. if lincoln had been assassinated lincoln would have had to address those same extremely difficult problems but sure. i would say too that you know the abolitionists they were they were very, their, their uh, approach was very moralistic. Mm -hmm. And that was both a strength and a weakness in, yeah. in the sense that they, um, they were, many of them motivated by religious conviction mm -hmm. and they were, they wanted to speak the truth regardless of consequences uh, leave the consequences to God, and you need people like that. I mean, they were they played an essential role in helping to turn public opinion against slavery. But people like that are also not disposed to make that kinds of compromises right. that yeah. that uh, effective legislation depends upon. Right. So the abolitionists, you know, un unfortunately, even before the war, mm. were very factional. Right. Um, they all they all agreed that slavery was was evil, but they they had the differences among themselves that prevented um, that prevented their working together uh, very effectively. And so, you know, whereas Lincoln, you know, as we've already talked about, Lincoln understood that to build a majority, you had to bring together people who had right. who disagreed among themselves on many things. You have to find some way. You can't actually silence the disagreements, but you you find whatever whatever is the priority thing that they can agree upon and emphasize that and de-emphasize the disagreements. And 
uh, the abolitionists were not as good as that, as uh, that side of politics as Lincoln was. Yeah. Agreed. Um, all right. Now, before we start the recording, you did mention that you did want to briefly talk about the cover of your book. Um, I will, for those who are watching it as a video, I will bring it up. For those who are just listening in to us, the book cover is George Caleb Bingham's The County Election 1854, mm -hmm. which I'll put a link into the uh, description of the podcast for that as well. But um, Jim, why is that picture especially for your cover? What? Well, what it is a, the... um, well, I wanted a cover for the book that was not just another image of Lincoln that people <laughs> have seen hundreds of times before. We appreciate that. Yeah. So um, and in this case, what you see in the cover of the book is a picture of a county of a local election in Missouri, which was an adjoining state. Uh, this is um, uh, very much like what Lincoln would have uh, participated in many times in Illinois. And it pictures a whole community. Um, and you see uh, in the in the painting, you see people going up to the county clerk and reporting their vote. Most mm -hmm. American states did not have a secret ballot at that point in time. So uh, th that is accurate to um, to the way elections were carried out. And then you see uh, many different people and in certain ways. This is like, you know, Bruegel paintings, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where you see a whole community and all of its characters. I think that this is an American kind of equivalent of that, mm -hmm. that there are some people and uh, that you see in there on, on sort of the right side of the panel who are appear well educated having mm -hmm. very thoughtful discussions of important issues mm -hmm. on the left side you see people getting drunk yes which uh, also I really enjoys that part of that picture it was actually one of the one of the scandals that that uh some candidates you know would uh, ply their supporters with alcohol as a way of winning their votes this is part of the reason why in many states for a long time, they uh, they the, the states uh, banned uh, bars, uh, closed mm -hmm. down bars and liquor sales on election day. Yes. So um, you all of all of the voters featured are men. Uh, there's no women uh, there reporting their vote. That was you know unfortunately mm -hmm. also the case in the 1850s that women uh, were not permitted to vote. At the far left of the panel, there's a black man uh, who is uh, mm -hmm. a, a serving somebody. We don't know if he's uh, free or enslaved. Uh, Missouri was a slave state, um, but he could have also been a free person of color. Um, so this is a picture of the whole community. Mm -hmm. In uh, it's not a perfect community. It's no. it's uh, it has its flaws. Mm -hmm. And and yet uh, Lincoln trusted the voters right. um, th that with all their flaws, this was the best way to make decisions, certainly right. compared to any other alternative. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why I chose that for the cover of the book. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I always when I, I taught this picture every time when I did the United States during that period and uh, we also looked at like that that guy at the top of the stairs there kind of trying at the last minute to influence a voter or the <laughs> right. like the guy that seems to be like passed out getting carried to the stairs to pass this yeah, vote right, and it's, like, right. it, it's such a beautiful picture to kind of talk about the election environment and also kind of how, yeah. how it's difficult also, you know, democracy is Yes. And there's there's a there's you can't it's can't read it so much in the cover of the book, but there's a blue banner above where people are reporting mm -hmm. their votes. The blue banner says the will of the people. Oh, jeez, I didn't. Yeah. Mm. Perfect. Perfect. Majority rule, the sovereignty of the people that we have. My gosh, it, it it's such a fascinating, fascinating topic. And so currently relevant mm -hmm. um, 
began that. Yes, I would say that it's disturbingly relevant in the United States. Yes. Usually, it's... I think authors think it's good uh, or happy if their book has relevance. Mm -hmm. In my case, the relevance of this book is uh, a cause of deep anxiety to me. I, I can see that. I can very much see that. And I think many Civil War historians looking at the current situation and knowing what we went through in the 1860s are worried of mm -hmm. what what is happening currently yeah it's um it is rather disturbing um i'm going to ask now because you already have this was your fourth book yeah <laughs> what's the next one going to be well the, the next book of uh, you know i have sort of this dual as a, as a writer both one side of me is in history of American political thought, and the other one is in theorizing about the nature of political power, and in particular, oh. whether political power should be understood as zero sum or variable sum, zero sum being one's gain is another's loss, yeah. variable sum, that it's possible for people to either gain power together or lose power together. And there are connections between those things. I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, Lincoln's saying, rejecting the idea that there was just one plank and you can only mm -hmm. save yourself by throwing the other off. He was saying, no, this is not a zero sum situation. Right. So um, mm. my next book is really going back to uh, something that was my doctoral dissertation <laughs> and the source of many articles over the years is a, a systematic examination of, of uh, the question of whether power should be understood as zero sum or variable sum and making an argument for a variable sum understanding of power. So uh, that wow. does have connections with my, um, the other side of my uh, professional work in, in the history of American political thought. Yeah. Wow. That sounds very fascinating. And um, again, definitely sort of like as so many people in politics, especially public activists think in those zero sum terminology is a very important work to add um, to kind of say, no, 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 we all lose when you do something. And I think some yeah. recent decisions are very much illustrative of that. Yeah. That um, unfortunately is what we sometimes forget about. So, yeah. um, but with that, let's, um, come to an end here it was a great pleasure jim for to have you today on the podcast well uh, thank you for inviting me i would like to say to any listeners um you are welcome to uh email me with questions thoughts um uh i have a a website james h reed author uh uh, dot com. You can also email me uh, j r e a d at c s b s j u dot e d u. That's my university address. I welcome your thoughts and observations, and uh, uh, I'm, I look forward to con continuing the conversation. Yeah, I I may actually bring you back in a few months to kind of talk more about secession okay. and intellectual thoughts. That's yes. something yeah, that that's, very that's, much that's interests me. The whole secession issue, uh, there's there's a whole other conversation for that one. Oh, yes. Yeah. We Once the craziness of my summer goes by, I'll be back. <laughs> but just as a kind of reminder, if you're interested in James's Jim's book, uh, it's the so Sovereign of a Free People, Abraham Lincoln, Majority Rule and Slavery, published by the University Press of Kansas. And you can find it at the press website or at various other locations. Um, again, thank you so much, Jim. Um, I hope you have thank a you. wonderful day and you too. enjoy the rest of the semester. Yes, you too.